Hello, welcome to this edition of Inside Egypt. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Campaigning for presidential elections began in Egypt on Saturday. It'll be a two-way contest between the former army chief, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, and the former parliamentarian, Hamdin Sabahi. Sisi, unsurprisingly, is expected to win the May elections. The polls are expected to be held on the 26th and 27th of this month. Well, the campaign comes less than a week after a Cairo judge handed out death sentences to over 600 people. Most, if not all, are members of the banned Muslim Brotherhood. They're charged with crimes against the state, including the killing of a policeman and of attacking security installations. Egyptian judges are independent and there is no control over them. Nobody in the state is directing the judge, neither a minister nor an official. We all know there have been uh, disturbing decisions within the judicial process, uh, the court system, uh, that have raised serious challenges for all of us. Well, the court proceedings and presidential campaign are taking place as violence escalates across Egypt. Two suicide attacks in the Sinai Peninsula killed a soldier on Friday, and anti-coup demonstrations turned bloody in the city of Alexandria. At least two protesters were killed there. Stephanie Decker reports. This is the aftermath of a suicide bombing in the Sinai Peninsula. It targeted a police checkpoint in the town of Tur Sinai and killed or wounded several people. It was just one of a series of explosions across Egypt on Friday. This was the scene on the road from Tur Sinai to the city of Sham al-Sheikh on the Red Sea coast. The bus was carrying workers to the tourist venue when a suicide bomber blew up his device. In the capital Cairo, an improvised explosive device was detonated outside a courthouse in the suburb of Heliopolis. It thought the bomb was placed in a traffic signal control box. I was driving my car this morning and heard a loud explosion. We found three injured people on the street and one of them had a serious injury to his neck. Friday also saw demonstrations for and against the military-led government. In the capital's Nasser city, members of the anti-coup alliance took to the streets to proclaim their opposition to Field Marshal Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Obviously, through the previous few months ago, the momentum in the streets have increased heavily. And that because of the so, so mad and crazy policies that the, the coup government have been taking. But elsewhere, it was different. As in here, where a few hundred CC supporters staged a rival rally in Nasser City, chanting slogans directed against the deposed President Mohamed Morsi. This month, Egyptians are expected to vote on his successor, with many believing Abdel Fattah al-Sisi will be the winner. Stephanie Decker, Al Jazeera. All right, let's bring in our guests for today. From Dallas, we're joined by Saha Aziz, Associate Professor of Law at Texas A&M University. Saha is also President of the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association. From London, we're joined by Nicholas Pirchot, North Africa campaigner for Amnesty International and uh, Egypt researcher. And also in London, James Boys, a historian specializing in U.S. politics and author of the forthcoming book, Clinton's Grand Strategy. Welcome uh, to Inside Egypt, all of you. Saha, if we start with you. Uh, Egypt's Minister of Justice, we heard him a few moments ago, insisting uh, that uh, the country's judges are independent and that there is no government control over them. Do we believe him? Well, the answer is complicated. There is no direct government control, but there is indirect government control. When I say government, I mean executive branch control. Uh, relative to other institutions, uh, Egypt's judiciary has been relatively independent. So much so that in the last 10 years of Mubarak's era, he was very actively packing the courts with judges who he believed would be loyal to him. Judges that graduated from the military academies, college of law, or the police academies, college of law, and attempting to increase the number of those judges within the judiciary, and eventually, and indirectly, those judges would influence how decisions were made. The other problem you have is the Ministry of Justice has significant powers in determining who enters the Attorney General's office, and that essentially is the pathway to becoming a judge. And oftentimes the Attorney General selects individuals who, again, have some association with the police or the military and tend to be very 
pro-law uh, enforcement, and that creates uh, overall bias in favor of the government. So the answer is, is complicated, but there is certainly some truth to that allegation. Nicholas, what's Amnesty's view of the Egyptian judicial system? Well, the mass death sentences we saw handed down on Monday weren't the work of just one rogue judge. They're pointing to a criminal justice system which is spiraling out of control. This is the same criminal justice system which is ignoring gross human rights violations by the security forces while jailing peaceful protesters and putting journalists on trial just for doing their job. I think if anyone was in any doubt about the real impact that these rulings are having, they should look at what happened outside the court earlier this week where one of our trial observers was told by one of the defendants that there is no justice in Egypt anymore. We don't trust anybody except God. James, um, uh, what needs to happen to uh, restore the credibility of the judicial system uh, in, in Egypt? The, the appeals uh, process uh, still seems to have some credibility. Yes, and there's obviously going to be some discussion about how many of these sentences will actually be carried out. Certainly, if the United States has its way, um, most, if not all, will be commuted in one way or another. And, of course, it's important to note that as a, Egypt's major client, you know, the United States isn't pumping $1.5 billion worth of aid into the country without any expectation of some degree of leverage. And this certainly is a major embarrassment to the Obama administration, coming so soon after the administration has just signed off on providing, was it, 10 latest attack class helicopters to the Egyptian leadership. So they'll certainly be looking to leverage some degree of influence over this administration in, uh, in Cairo ahead of the elections and certainly looking to foster far better relations uh, with the incoming administration uh, following the, uh, the elections at the end of the month. All right, you've all raised points that, uh, to, that I want to, to, to dig deeper into uh, here. Uh, Saha, is judicial reform uh, in Egypt vital um, to restoring a, a, a true functional democracy in the country? Absolutely, and I think it affects all aspects of society. So the one aspect that I think the executive branch cares the most about and that I suspect the next president of Egypt will care very much about, which we all believe is likely to be uh, former General Abdel Fattah Sisi, is economic development. Egypt is suffering from very serious economic problems. And many of those problems were the root causes for the January 25th uprising. So if those economic inequities, the income disparities, uh, the, just the, the general malaise, economic malaise, is not resolved, then more political instability is likely to come in the future. And that is intimately connected to the judiciary, because if you don't have an independent judiciary that both parties can go to and believe will uh, be objective and impartial, then the foreign investor investors will not likely invest in Egypt. So that's, that's one reason. The second reason, which is equally important, is for political and human rights. Um, and so what we're seeing now is individuals who are being sentenced in, in mass, essentially, after very minimal due process, if any due process rights. And that is undermining the legitimacy of the judiciary. And there are many very ethical um, judges and competent judges in the judiciary. The problem is that you have also other judges that are unfortunately not taking their obligations, their professional obligations very seriously and putting their political loyalties ahead of their fiduciary duties as judges. And so I think that the good judges, what I'll call the good judges, the ethical judges, need to institute, for example, judicial councils, judicial training institutes, uh, reform the ways in which judges are appointed, ensure that the Ministry of Judge Justice has minimal influence in how the governance and operation of the judiciary um, is conducted. And I think in the long run that is going to preserve the judiciary as an institution. Nicholas, what do you think was, was the aim of imposing these, these maths uh, death sentences? Uh, was, it, um, was it to scare people? And is there a danger that it could perhaps have uh, the opposite effect? Could it end up radicalizing even more people? It sent a very clear message to the Muslim Brotherhood and its supporters. Of that, there's no doubt. But as well as a political decision, I think we have to look at the human element of it. Families have been destroyed by this sentence. And even the sentences which have been commuted effectively to life imprisonment 
these people will spend 25 years behind bars, so it's far from a re remedy in any case. I mean, I think the real tragedy is that for years the judiciary was the only body really able to stand up to the authorities. You know, many people still speak of the judges who stood up and protested Hosni Mubarak's attempts to undermine them in 2007, or the judges who shut down the courts after Mohamed Morsi decreed himself almost absolute powers in 2012. What we see in Egypt today is a selective judicial system, one which lets security forces get away with murder while cracking down on anybody who is prepared to challenge the authorities. Those include people like Al Jazeera journalists Peter Grist, Mohammed Fahmi, and uh, Baha Mohammed, whose bail was denied once again today. James, um, is there any doubt that, that, that Sisi will, will win the presidency? And uh, do you think that um, uh, his election would give him a, cer a certain legitimacy in the eyes of the U.S. and allow the U.S. to, to perhaps normalize relations with Egypt and apply uh, and apply more pressure on the country? Well, I think most forecasters believe that that outcome is the most likely. Uh, how the United States uh, must be ruining the day, quite frankly, that it, uh, it decided uh, whether to get engaged with regard to the, the situation in Egypt. So if you think about how this administration began with Barack Obama, it began so well in, in Cairo when one thinks about the speech that he gave at the university, very much uh, issuing a new dawn, effectively, for U.S. relations in, in the Middle East. That seems a very, very long time ago now. Uh, the idea that this administration really has uh, dithered effectively, not knowing which way to jump. Uh, on the one hand, uh, siding with, uh, with Mubarak, then eventually moving away from that support, uh, embracing a sense of democratic change in that part of the world, then all of a sudden realizing, oh crikey, that means we've been left with a Muslim Brotherhood, not wanting to call uh, his overthrow of Morsi a coup for obvious reasons. It really is a shambolic relationship in that part of the world at this part of the time. One can only hope, I think, from a White House perspective, that the forthcoming elections lead to a sense of calm uh, and that somehow there may be some way of addressing these, uh, uh, these sentences uh, which have been handed out that we're talking about today, which will allow for a sense of uh, equilibrium, effectively, a period of calm uh, for the, the remaining months, stroke years of the Obama administration to settle down uh, and give rise to a new era in U.S.-Egyptian relations. Those relations are essential to that part of the world. Uh, the great unspoken uh, elephant in the room, if you will, that we're not addressing, obviously, is Israel. And, of course, the relationship between I Israel, Egypt, and the United States is an essential one. Uh, and as I said in my earlier response, the United States isn't pumping $1.5 billion worth of aid, most of it militarily, into Egypt without expecting something out of that. And that, of course, has a direct bearing upon Egyptian relationships uh, with the state of Israel. Okay, you raised some points there that I want to come back to in just a moment. But first, uh, we'll, we'll pause because uh, I want to remind you uh, about how this crackdown against anti-coup activists all began in Egypt. It started with last year's coup led by uh, former army chief Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, and this led to mass arrests, mostly of uh, Muslim Brotherhood activists and the Muslim Brotherhood leadership. Five months after that, the uh, Brotherhood was declared a terrorist group by the army-backed government. Now, courts across Egypt are passing harsh sentences against political activists and journalists seem to be acting against the, uh, the country's interests. Um, Saha, is the, the authoritarian mode of, uh, of politics that, that seems to be the long-term norm in Egypt, despite all uh, that's happened, uh, sustainable in the long run? Well, I think that the Arab uprisings, uh, or the Arab Spring, has shown that it is not sustainable. And what has happened is a regression back to authoritarianism in contradiction to what most, the millions, the tens of millions of Egyptians wanted when they went out into the streets on January 25, 2011. And so what's happened is many of them have been duped. And they thought that when they went out on July 3rd, that they were essentially sending a very strong message to former President Mohamed Morsi that you are behaving like the former President Mubarak. We are not accepting it. We want new elections, and we want them to be democratic, and, uh, and you need to go. Unfortunately, what ended up happening is that the military took over, 
and now you have the same types of practices from the, the judicial rulings and the corruption of the judiciary to now you have the banning of the April 6th movement, which was one of the most significant movements uh, that, were, that led the January 25th revolution. And you've got three uh, major youth activists, uh, Muhammad Duma, uh, Ahmed Meher, and others, and Ali Abdel Fattah is now awaiting trial. So what you have is a complete quashing of political dissent. And so the question is, where is the United States going to take a stand in light of what we've seen in the past, which is that authoritarianism is not sustainable? And so it will be very interesting to see how the United States and the next Egyptian regime reacts to this because I think that they're just postponing the inevitable and it's just simply okay. no longer a sustainable form of government in modern times. All right, Nicholas, I'll, I'll put this question to you, but I have a feeling that, that both Saha and, and James will want to come in on, on this as well. To what extent is the, the U.S.'s war on terror, uh, to what extent has that legitimized the actions of the Egyptian military and, and, and led to this persecution of political opponents in Egypt? Well, for decades, really, Egypt's government has said that security trumps human rights, and they've been promising that they deliver stability to Egyptians for 30 to, to 40 years. But the truth is what they haven't been able to deliver is the bread, freedom, and social justice that was the call of the, the tens of thousands of people who took to the streets in in Cairo's Tahrir Square and, uh, and across the country in, in January 2011. Uh, but if we look at the, the US's role in this, I mean, I think, let's get this straight, Egypt is the Bermuda Triangle of trade and aid because human rights gets lost in the middle. It's difficult to see how the US can uh, condemn lethal force against protesters one week while preparing to ship Apache gunships to the Egyptian authorities the other. You know, both the U.S. and the EU said that they were caught by surprise by the 2011 uprisings, and I think that's fair enough. But to be walking around more than three years later with only knee-jerk reactions is uh, unbelievable. It's time for real leadership on these human rights issues, not, uh, you know, patchwork condemnations which are immediately undermined by shipping of equipment which would facilitate gross human rights violations. Uh, Saha, do you want to come in on that? No, I agree. I think that it's not in the United States' best interest in the long run to support authoritarian regimes. I'm also very concerned about the rule of law issues in the United States. We have laws here on the books in the U.S. that prohibit our taxpayer dollars from going to any regime anywhere in the world uh, that is a product of a military coup. And the question in Egypt is very much up for debate. I mean, there will be some legal experts will say it absolutely is a military coup. Uh, so the question is, how is this legal in the United States? And I think that most congressional leaders also have a legal obligation to ensure that American law is upheld. It's one thing for Egyptian for the Egyptian government to violate its laws, but it's a whole other thing for the U.S. government to violate its laws. And I think that then undermines the rule of law in the United States. James, um, you, you talked about uh, much of the U.S.'s approach to, to Egypt uh, relating to, to Israel. Um, but is the Obama administration concerned uh, that if it, it forces Egypt, if it applies too much pressure and forces Egypt out of its sphere of influence, then uh, it will merely push it into the arms of Russia? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, all I can do is very much agree with the previous speaker from, from an A&M, basically, on the basis that what you've seen happen uh, is an administration which is, you know, just as the Clinton administration with regard to Rwanda refused to refer to it as genocide because it would automatically trigger an international response. So too as the Obama administration uh, refused to refer to uh, the coup effectively for not dissimilar reasons. We've seen, I think, over the last uh, couple of years Arguably, the policies of the George W. Bush administration with regard to the war on terror, for example, being used against the United States on the basis that if any government around the world wants to crack down upon any organization it disapproves of, what do you do? You call them a terrorist organization on the basis that it's very difficult for any White House on the basis of what has happened in the past 10 years to have any great complaint with that. 
We've seen, for example, uh, with regards to what Vladimir Putin has been doing in Russia, with the way in which the United States movements into Iraq have been used very much against any uh, attempts to condemn Russian moves into Ukraine uh, and Crimea. So what you're seeing, I think, is uh, American foreign policy of the last decade or so being used against it. The great challenge now, of course, is how do we keep Egypt within what could be seen as a Western sphere of influence? Throughout the Cold War, uh, Nasser was very, very adept and adroit at using uh, Egypt's key geostrategic positioning against uh, both the West and the East, moving from alliances with uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, playing one against each other. With the re-emergence of Vladimir Putin on the world stage and his attempts to try to reinvigorate a vigorous uh, Russian foreign policy, the risk here surely is that uh, talk of uh, embargoes, sanctions, especially coming out of the Congress uh, against Egypt, uh, will very much, I think, embolden Egypt and say, well, you know what, uh, if you're not going to be allied with us, we can see the writing on the wall, we can start making moves to, uh, to pally up effectively uh, with the Kremlin, uh, which could have all sorts of implications uh, in the Middle East, I think. Saha, uh, just touching on something you said right back at the beginning of our discussion, what has the overthrow of Mohamed Morsi actually achieved? Security, still a, a, a growing problem. The economy remains uh, in a parlous state. The country diplomatically isolated. There's deep polarization within uh, Egyptian society. Why have, have the coup leaders failed to address any of this? Well, I think because they're going back to the same rules of the game that have failed. And that is using force instead of political reconciliation, negotiation, mediation. It is the zero-sum game that's dominated Egyptian politics, where my way or the highway, and if you don't agree with me, I will, impose, I will use violence to quash you, kill you, or torture you. And the Egyptian population, particularly the youth, no longer want to operate by those rules. They want an open society where they can speak freely, where people can disagree and engage in freedom of speech and expression, and use the, a democratic process that's fair and transparent to work out their disputes. And one at one day you may be the winner, and next day you may be the loser, and, and learning how to lose. And so I think they're going back to the same old rules that have failed. And I think that the United States also needs to understand that you know, they are supporting Egypt for, for reasons that, that my colleague has, has mentioned um, in terms of security. But the practices that have been going on for the last nine months have not brought Egypt more security. It's actually brought it more violence. And so their, their question remains as to why isn't the United States assisting in mediation, in negotiation, in trying to get the different parties to sit down together and work it out so that Egypt doesn't, as a, as a country, suffer. Uh, uh, James, I have a feeling this is going to be the, the, the final word. I, I just want to get your thoughts on okay. who you think is behind uh, the violence in, in both Sinai and uh, in, in Cairo. Uh, and if you think that there will be a, 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 a concerted campaign of violence now ahead of the election. Yeah, I think one can only forecast the future based upon the recent past. And I think if you've seen what's been transpiring over the last weeks and months, uh, there's very little reason to believe that that won't continue uh, into the, the very near future. The great challenge is what is the United States going to do about this? I would suggest that as we move into the silly season of the midterm elections and then into the, uh, the presidential elections, the answer is probably very little. I think John Kerry will be doing some shuttling around. Maybe Martin Indyk might get involved. But I really think that this administration is uh, really on its last legs uh, with very little to offer in that part of the world, alas. And Nicholas, one, one final thought from you very briefly. Well, I, I think it's time for, for the world to get serious about Egypt's human rights crisis. You know, in August we saw mass killings of protesters, but it took the world more than six months to speak up in the Human Rights Council. The final word is what we need is leadership, not knee-jerk reactions. Okay. Many thanks to you all. I'm afraid we're out of time. Saha Aziz uh, in Dallas, Nicholas Pearshow in London, and James Boyce also uh, in London. A reminder that uh, Al Jazeera has been unable to report from Egypt this year because our team there is in detention and has been since December 29th. Peter Grester, Mohammed Fami and Baha Mohammed are falsely accused of providing a platform to the outlawed Muslim Brotherhood. Abdullah Al Shami, meanwhile, from Al Jazeera's Arabic channel has been detained without trial since last August. Al Jazeera rejects all the charges against its staff 
and continues to demand their immediate release. Keep up to date with Al Jazeera's extensive and continuing coverage of what's happening in, in Egypt on air and online. Let us know your thoughts too. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Thanks for watching. From me and all the team, bye for now.